and welcome to Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. I'm your host, Shivani Desai. Today I'll be talking about Season 5, Episode 15, The Pie. Hello everyone, welcome to the 75th episode of Hot and Heavy, the Elaine Bennis podcast. How great is that? I'm so excited to have gotten this far and even more excited to keep going. We're getting into the glory days of Seinfeld and it's just going to keep getting better and better from here on out. So, uh, so happy to have 75 episodes under my belt and yeah, it's just going to keep going until the end and I hope you all join me for the rest of the way. Other than that, this is uh, the last day. I'm enjoying my last day before my kids are home for holiday break and my mom is coming uh, tomorrow to visit for about a month. So yeah, lots uh, going on in the next couple of (laughs) weeks, especially with the kids home. Um, But it's all going to be good. You know, that's what the holidays are all about. Fun activities, staying home and enjoying each other's company. Um, I really don't have it bad. I, I, I'm not one of those moms that like dreads having the kids home. I'm pretty lucky in that way. We all kind of keep to ourselves and do our own thing for the most part. <laughs> I don't know if that's a bad thing. Um, no, but we, we make sure to do really fun activities together as well. I did want to give a happy update on a friend of mine that I had mentioned a couple of episodes ago about her colon cancer journey. My friend uh, was diagnosed. She's 39 years old, had a family history, so she went and got a colonoscopy way earlier than recommended. But um, yeah, she went through her surgery and is on the road to recovery. I'm really happy to report that she was stage one and they said the surgery would be enough to get rid of the cancer. It didn't spread. Um, All her lymph nodes were clean. So no chemo, no further treatment, but obviously you know, intense monitoring of her health and especially cancer screenings and, and, and whatnot. But, you know, I think <laughs> as she put it, she posted a really, um, you know, beautiful message about kind of an announcing to social media about what she went through. And also, you know, just telling people, hey, don't don't put off these screenings and make sure you're taking care of yourself. You know, she talked about how she's 39. (laughs) And that it seems relatively young to be diagnosed with cancer. And that because of her healthy lifestyle, her doctors said, you probably kept this cancer at bay. It was probably growing in your in your body for five to 10 years, even, but your healthy lifestyle really, um, you know, kept it at bay, kept it from spreading. And so she talked about that and said, do do your best. We can't control everything. You know, I thought I was doing everything I could to stay healthy. And, and I was, I suppose, not that her healthy lifestyle didn't help at all, because clearly it did, but that <laughs> you can't really fight against something that's genetic or just in the cards for you, unfortunately, as, as really cruel fate would have it sometimes. But Anyway, she just put out this really great message. And I just wanted to, if any of you were wondering, I just wanted to let you know that she's still recovering. It's hard for her. I've been texting with her and (laughs) talking about just how hard it is to be patient. You know, she wants to get kind of back to normal, but the doctors are like, you've been through a major surgery. (laughs) You have to be patient with your body. It's going to take time to heal. So that's sort of driving her nuts. But um, of course, she's incredibly thankful to be Uh, pretty much cured at this point um, from her cancer. And as her friend, I am absolutely thrilled for her. The world needs her. She's a special soul. Another a little announcement I wanted to make, I'm taking a couple of weeks off as I usually do around the holidays. So thank you so much, you guys, for listening and, and being a part of the podcast this year. I really love your words of encouragement. So thank you so much. I've got some exciting things planned in 2023 in regards to the podcast. Um, I've been networking with some really great uh, local podcasters and I've just gotten some good tips, you know, things that are probably known to very experienced podcasters. But um, as I've said before, I'm very, I'm very much self-taught, 100% self-taught for <laughs> podcasting. And so, uh, yeah, I, I am taking a lot of these tips to heart and, you know, I need to get them all organized and figured out so that I can implement them in the next year. And that will hopefully 
increased visibility and listenership. So I'm really excited for all that stuff in 2023, including some merchandise you guys can purchase if you're so inclined. And well, I guess to end my banter on sort of a somber note, yesterday I saw the announcement of the death of Sonia Eddy. Now, she played Rebecca de Mornay on a couple of episodes of Seinfeld, and <laughs> I'll, I'll get more into her performance when we reach those episodes on the pod, but one of my favorite guest actresses, and she's also a very accomplished actress outside of her Seinfeld appearances. In fact, she was, I believe, on uh, General Hospital for m- like hundreds and hundreds of episodes, but kind of sad. She was only 55 years old, and of course, I can't help but think... The hot and heavy curse, was this because of my podcast? (laughs) Of course it's not. But contributor Greg has pointed out the number of deaths of Seinfeld alumni (laughs) after I started this podcast. So I don't know what to think, but at any rate, condolences to Sonia Eddy's family and loved ones. She was was a talent, and I really, uh, really enjoy her appearances on Seinfeld. All right, let's get into this episode. The synopsis for the pie from my coffee table book is as follows. Jerry is obsessed with learning why his girlfriend, Audrey, won't take a bite of his apple pie. Then Jerry refuses to try a pizza made by Audrey's father, Poppy, after Jerry sees him not wash his hands after going to the bathroom. Kramer dates a coffee shop cashier simply because she's good at scratching his itchy back. George buys an expensive suit at half price, then learns it makes a swooshing noise when he walks. Elaine wants to know why a department store mannequin looks just like her. This episode was written by Tom Gamble and Max Pross. Right, we start out the episode in Monk's. Jerry is with his girlfriend, Audrey, and they're just wrapping up their meal, but then he gets an apple pie delivered to the table. Oh, best apple pie in the city. I'm not waiting for you. He starts eating it. He offers it to her and she says, no. Oh, do you not like apple pie? No, it's not that. Well, you won't even taste it? No. (laughs) So she keeps refusing it to the point where she's just not saying anything and shaking her head, just shaking her head. Come on, try it. Just keeps shaking her head. Now, Audrey is played by Suzanne Snyder, who appeared in the limo episode as another character. She played the hot Nazi. Now, I don't know how I feel about this, but I think I enjoyed her as a Nazi more than I do as Audrey. (laughs) Um, I don't know. I just think she really phones it in a little bit in, in this episode as Audrey. I think this could have been a really fun comedic role for another actress, but in, in Suzanne Snyder's hands, it just falls flat for me. I don't know if she was directed this way or what, but yeah, I just feel like it's written a certain way and she's got this head shaking plot, but I, I don't know. She's, she's just very boring for me in this episode. I prefer her as a Nazi. All right, next we're in Jerry's apartment. Jerry is telling George about Audrey not tasting the pie and that she had no explanation. She just she was shaking her head like this. No, she's not diabetic because she carries donuts in her purse. And then George says, well, maybe you said something to offend her. The only thing Jerry can think is he suggested that they should have those moving walkways all over the city, like the ones at the airport. George loses his mind. He loves that idea. They could be zipping all over the place. Elaine enters as Jerry is saying, you know, there's no reason for her not to taste the pie. Elaine asks, who didn't taste the pie? Audrey. Dumper, she says. (laughs) For not tasting pie? And Elaine says, I've broken up with someone for not offering me pie. Wow. (laughs) Wow. She's like, you know, he could have been eating a hero. He wouldn't offer me anything. It's a, it's a sickness. Now, this reminded me of something personal. My now husband, Paul, um, he, I remember kind of being a little bit irked. I think it was like one of our first dates when we had like ordered a, like a salad for the table and he served himself first. And I don't know, I guess I was taught that, especially because in an Indian family, it's just, you know, big pots of different types of food put on the table and we all just kind of serve ourselves. But I had always observed, especially my parents, they would serve me and my brother first, you know, especially because we were little and we probably would make a mess if we were trying to serve ourselves all this Indian food. But so I just had sort of taken that in. And whenever I was in that kind of a situation, I would always serve the others first. It was just it was just a polite gesture to me. So <laughs> I just remember being like, huh, okay, so we get this 
salad and he just dives right in and serves himself first and then kind of turns the tongs to my side like hey now it's your turn and I was like I don't know how I feel about that I was definitely bothered by it (laughs) and then I was kind of bothered that I was bothered by it later I was like am I being too harsh but anyway um I think I did snarkily point that out to him maybe on a like our seventh or eighth date I'd be like oh you're not gonna serve yourself first and he was like but what and uh yeah ever since then he is a serve others first person So you know what, you guys, people say you can't change a boyfriend or a girlfriend, but I'm living proof. I changed my husband from being a serve yourself first to serve others first person. So you can change people. Try it. It always works. All right. um, Back to the scene. George cannot get off this moving walkway idea. He's so distracted. (laughs) He's just going to be wishing there were those moving walkways everywhere. He looks at Elaine and she's got her shoe off. He's, what are you doing? She's got a pebble in her shoe. Jerry says, wow, I've never heard that happening to a woman. (laughs) And she immediately is so mad. What the hell does that mean? Kramer enters. He sees Elaine there and he's like, hey, hey, Elaine, stand up and pose this way. And he like puts himself in this kind of like robotic pose. So she does it and he goes, oh, yeah. There's a clothing store downtown with a mannequin that looks just like Elaine. It's uncanny. She gives him a get out shove. (laughs) It's really quite exquisite. (laughs) George asks which store. He says, Renitzi's. Kramer then gets a spatula out of Jerry's drawer and starts scratching his back with it. (laughs) Jerry says, may I help you? Well, he's got an itch. He was watching TV on an uncovered couch cushion. (laughs) Well, of course, that's going to cause an itchy back. George asks, is that the store with really good suits? Oh, yeah, real boss. Elaine tells George, well, I'm going down there. And George says, yeah, I'm going to come with you. He has a second interview with Mackenzie and he wants to get a new suit. And then Elaine drags George out. They exit. And Jerry tells Kramer to keep the spatula. My take on the scene, um, there's not much to say. I wish we got to hear more about Elaine's non-offering boyfriend, though. I think that sounded like a fun story. Also, not sure why she gets so annoyed with Jerry's pebble comment. <laughs> but I think I've been in this state of mind. Sometimes you just get worked up. Maybe maybe something sexist happened to her right before she got there and she's just stewing about it or something, you know. And then no matter what, if someone suggests that maybe women don't experience something the same as men, you're just going to get pissed off about it. I- I've been there too, Elaine. I get it. All right, next we're at Renitzi's, the clothing store. George and Elaine are standing next to this mannequin who looks exactly like Elaine. And she says, it looks exactly like me. George is freaked out for her. Don't don't fall asleep, Elaine. She's like, how could this have happened? Could, could it be a coincidence? George then sees a suit that he just really loves. He puts on the jacket. A saleswoman comes over and says that he's perfect for that suit. Elaine asks her, excuse me, where did you get this mannequin? And she says, uh, I don't know. The actress who plays the saleswoman is another returning actress here, Christine Dunford, who first appeared on Seinfeld as Elaine's college friend, Leslie, in the baby shower episode. And oh my gosh, opposite of how I feel about Suzanne Snyder's second appearance, I think Christine Dunford is fantastic as this woman. Oh my gosh, I love everything about every second of her performance. Um, And I often drop into her accent whenever I have to say I don't know. I just love the way she says, (laughs) I don't know. Really fun return performance by Christine Dunford. George asks her, you you really think so? It looks good and fabulous. The perfect fit and it's the last one we have. Elaine interjects. She doesn't really like how she was blown off. I'm sorry, you can't tell me where the mannequin came from? I told you, I don't know. Elaine's getting more and more irritated. Well, is there somebody here who would know? Why? Isn't it obvious this mannequin looks exactly like me? (laughs) The saleswoman then rolls her eyes at George. Ooh, wrong thing to do there. Elaine calls her out. Are you rolling your eyes at him? Because if anyone should be rolling their eyes, it should be me at him about you. The saleswoman says, look, I think you're flattering yourself. She points out the mannequin is wearing a $1,200... Gautier dress. Oh, 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 Elaine says, you you think I'm not good enough for this hideous dress? Listen, Natasha, I wouldn't be caught dead in your Euro trash rags. Tells George, I'm going to wait for you outside. Real quick, if you pause this episode at five minutes, 21 seconds, Elaine, on her way out, makes this face at the saleswoman 
It's hilarious. This rewatch was the first time I'd ever seen it, and it's delightful. So I just, uh, I'm going to post a picture of it on the hot and heavy Instagram, but um, it's it's just something that delighted me. Elaine leaves, and the saleswoman says, what is her problem? George is like, eh, what are you going to do? He looks at the price tag. Is this the price? Yes. Okay, party's over. It's too expensive for George. But then she says, you know, we're having an unadvertised sale and that suit will be half off on Friday. Well, George loves that, but she can't put it aside. It wouldn't be fair to the other customers. My take on this scene, it's a very strong Elaine scene. We see insulted Elaine, who doesn't take any shit from this saleswoman. And I'm pretty sure the saleswoman isn't named Natasha, so she's not named that in the credits. I think this is a comment referring to Rocky and Bullwinkle, the Boris and Natasha characters from that cartoon, So because they have like an accent similar to what uh, the saleswoman sounds like. So I think that was like her way of insulting her. Julie Louis-Dreyfus and Christine Dunford are great together, both really strong comedic actresses. Christine Dunford really gets more of the comedy here. It's such a strong character. She's got the accent. She's got the attitude. What a fun character to play. I love how George is so distracted by the suit. He doesn't even come to Elaine's defense at all. He's like, whatever, she can handle it. Let me just keep looking in the mirror at myself. All right, next we're at Monk's. Elaine is telling Kramer and Jerry that she found the manufacturer of the mannequin, but they wouldn't tell her how they got her face. Jerry isn't even listening. He's so distracted. Elaine's like, hello, Jerry. Then he gets up and goes to the booth behind them. He says he just noticed that one of the women offered her friend some pie, and that friend just waved it away. Now, did you give her a reason? Yes, I was full. So you gave a reason. You didn't just shake your head. No, I'm not a psycho. Exactly. (laughs) Well, Jerry's very thankful to these helpful women. He leaves the tip for them, returns to the table and says, I think we've proven who the psycho is. (laughs) Elaine's just looking at him like a, (laughs) she can't believe what she just saw. We certainly have. The actresses who uh, play these ladies at the booth, the woman who offered the pie is played by Patricia Belcher. I mean, she has easily one of the longest IMDb list of credits I've ever seen. She has been in everything and she's still working to this day. The woman who waved off the pie is played by Pamela Mant. Not as long of a credit list on IMDb, but she has regularly worked for many years. Even though their portion of the scene is so short, I think I think they're great. I love the sort of polite confusion they convey at Jerry's questions and the delivery of, no, I'm not a psycho. It makes me laugh every time. Great job by Patricia and Pamela. Kramer asks Elaine <laughs> to scratch his back. Of course, she's like, no, come on, it'll be a funky adventure. <laughs> she refuses. And same with Jerry. He thinks he knows his policy on that. Well, he's going home to spatula. Elaine asks where George is. I thought he was supposed to meet us. Well, Jerry says no. He's down at that store guarding the suit. (laughs) He's guarding a suit. The monk's cashier, not Ruthie Cohen this time, asks Kramer if he needs help with that itch. He's trying to reach his back. And then she reveals her long nails and tells him to turn around. She starts itching and he is just collapsing, melting from the pleasure of it all. The actress here who plays Olive, the monk's cashier, is Sunday Theodore. She appeared in some random shows in the 90s, um, some independent films, really nothing recent. And I decided to do more digging and then I found her on LinkedIn. Sunday Theodore looks like she is a club concierge at the Ritz-Carlton in New Orleans. And I know it was the same woman because she does list her um, time on Seinfeld in her profile. Um, I think she's adorable. She sort of reminds me of Brittany Murphy a little bit. And um, just like the Renitzi saleswoman, Olive is such a distinctive character. She's got the voice, this wardrobe, the gum chewing. It's so fun. It's just so fun to play those types of characters. So um, I really think Sunday Theodore uh, played it very well. And I was so bold. I messaged her on LinkedIn. I have yet to hear back, but I gave my spiel about producing this podcast, hosting it, and that I like to highlight female talent. We'll see if she gets back to me. All right, next we're at Renitzi's. That same saleswoman is now helping another guy with George's prized suit. (laughs) George sees this from the window and gets so irritated. He approaches the guy with the same accent as the woman, can I help you? And he's like, yeah, I'm buying this suit. No, 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 no. This suit is not for sale. Uh, Do you work here? 
And George gets out of the character. No. <laughs> the guy's like, well, then it's none of your business. And George says, look, I'm doing you a favor. And then he lies about the unadvertised sale. It says it will be starting on Monday. And the guy's like, oh, really? Then the saleswoman comes over and corrects him. Actually, the unadvertised sale starts on Friday. Oh, really? He gives George a look. George says, you know, for an unadvertised sale, you're really doing a lot of yapping about it. And then the saleswoman starts undressing the Elaine mannequin, and George <laughs> can't help but get a little flushed looking at topless Elaine. Well, topless Elaine mannequin. Next, we're at Poppy's. It's Audrey's father's restaurant. And we know that Jerry is not done thinking about the whole pie thing. He's looking at the menu and he asks about the desserts, asks Audrey if she's had them. Almost all of them. Oh, I see they have apple pie. She says she's had it several times. Well, Jerry can't go on. Look, he has to ask. He's curious by nature. Why didn't you eat the apple pie at Monk's? She won't give it up. She's just like, can we drop this? Then Poppy comes over to the table and meets Jerry and says that he's making a very special dinner for him and Audrey. Jerry gets up to go to the bathroom, tells Audrey, the pie, just think about it. In the bathroom, Jerry's at the sink. Poppy comes out from the stall and says he's going to personally prepare the dinner for he and the my Audrey. Then he exits without washing his hands. Jerry is, of course, horrified. He returns to the table in total shock. Audrey asks, what's wrong? You look like you've seen a ghost. Then he can see Poppy from the table, kneading the dough in his hands, his unwashed hands, and is completely horrified. And then a, a couple quick scenes. Uh, Olive is leaving work at Monk's, and then Kramer comes to give her flowers, and <laughs> she scratches his back on the way out. Then back at Poppy's, Poppy is serving them the pizza he prepared, but Jerry refuses to try it and shakes his head all Audrey style, <laughs> and Audrey is offended. You won't taste it? Jerry. Next to at Jerry's apartment, Jerry and George are on the couch eating cereal together. And Jerry says, well, Audrey thinks I did that to get back at her. And George is like, why did you just tell her? Well, I'm not sure it's the type of thing you want to hear about your father. And he said, you know, look, even if you're not going to soap up, you should at least pretend to wash your hands for my benefit. And George says, yeah, like I do. <laughs> not surprising that George doesn't wash every time. Jerry says a chef who doesn't wash is like a cop who steals. It's a cry for help. And George declares that Poppy's got some problems. Kramer enters and returns the spatula because he has Olive now. Jerry puts the spatula right into the garbage. Kramer tells him about her technique with the back scratching, the figure eight, strumming the old banjo, then a savage free-for-all. Then George has to get going to that store and get his suit. It opens in 20 minutes. Kramer asks if the Elaine mannequin is still there. Yeah, last time I saw her, she was naked. George says it with like a silly grin on his face. Jerry's like, oh, yeah, and, and Poppy's got problems. All right, next we're at Renitzi's. They unlock the door. George's suit nemesis runs to the rack where the suit was, but he doesn't see it. He asks in a panic, where is it? Where is it? George, meanwhile, saunters over to another rack. Oh, no, what is this doing here? <laughs> you bastard, you hid the suit. Hid? No, I have no idea how this suit got misplaced. Oh, George is so smug. That guy is so pissed. He hopes that George rots. He threatens him. He's going to pay. Oh, I'll pay. Half price. Arrivederci, my fellow 40 short. All right, next we're at Monk's. Elaine has a list of ideas of who could have made this mannequin, and she wants to tell Jerry, and he's very mildly interested. Okay, so first on the list, she starts talking about a blind guy she met at a party once who felt her face for a really long time, you know, to see what she looked like. He almost put his finger up my nose. And Jerry's like, all right, what else you got? Never mind. I'm not going to tell you the rest of the list. Oh, why? Because I don't think it was the blind guy? Because you have an attitude? George walks in wearing his new suit, strutting around, totally feeling himself. Elaine and Jerry are very impressed. George, yo, nice duds. He struts back and forth a couple of times, and they're hearing something. Yeah, like a swoosh. It must be the fabric. It's rubbing between your thighs when you walk. And then George hears it himself. He probably didn't hear it outside because of the street noise. He starts freaking out. He's got a meeting with Mackenzie in a half an hour. And Jerry's like, well, why would they care about that? Well, he says that this Mackenzie guy is a little bit nuts and that he fired the last guy because his nose whistled. Oh, so you don't think you're going to get the job because you have a noisy suit? <laughs> and he's like, well, if it's between me and a quiet suit, who do you think he's going to choose? 
Kramer, meanwhile, is hanging out with Olive at the register and tells Jerry, hey, I saw your girlfriend earlier. She ate a big slice of apple pie. <laughs> Jerry is so frustrated. This woman is bending my mind into a pretzel. A guy walks by and approaches the table, asks Elaine, do I know you? Mm, no, you don't. Yeah, you were wearing a G-string and one of those bras with points. <gasps> it's the mannequin. Jerry's like, oh, I got to see this thing. A quick take on this. A couple of fun Elaine moments. I like how she calls Jerry out for his attitude. And the, uh, mm, no, you don't. It's very fun. But overall, JLD doesn't get very much in this scene. All right, next we're back at Renitzi's. Elaine and Jerry enter <laughs> to see the Elaine mannequin bent over another mannequin's knee about to get spanked. Jerry's like, boy, the resemblance is uncanny. <laughs> Great line. Elaine rushes over to the saleswoman. That's my ass in your window. She's demanding that it be taken down. The saleswoman says it's their mannequin. They can do whatever they want with it. Well, Elaine's not backing down. She's going to press charges and says that Jerry is her attorney. Oh, yeah, what law am I breaking? And Jerry tries to come up with some legalese and precedents. And uh, the saleswoman's like, I'm going to get the manager. And she leaves. Elaine's like, Jerry, get the car. <laughs> and she steals the mannequin. <laughs> and Jerry says, as your legal counsel, I must advise against this. Then we cut to Jerry's car. We see Elaine, Elaine's mannequin, and Jerry. And Jerry looks over and says, I don't know about you, but I'm getting a hankering for some double mint gum. Now, for you youngsters out there, this is a reference to double mint gum commercials a long, long time ago where they would um, feature the double mint twins. So that's what he's talking about. Then Jerry says he's going to drop her off at work and he is heading to Poppy's. My take on this scene, I like all the action in this scene. Elaine throwing the lawyer thing to Jerry and him very, very well. Great improv, Jerry. He's totally yes-anding everything. But I don't know. I got to say, I don't know what the other choice would have been, but I don't love Elaine being so offended by this mannequin. But I also, I don't, I totally don't disagree with it. I think she's, she's dealing with the emotions of where the hell this came from, like this creepy homage to her likeness. So I guess she's not being totally logical and she very much feels like it's her being posed that way. But anyway, it's a little silly, but you know, I forgive it. And it within that choice of her being so offended, stealing it totally works. I love the visual of her carrying it out the door. <laughs> and that shot in the car is really funny as well. And I kind of wish, I don't think we ever see the mannequin again. We don't know where it ended up. All right, next couple of scenes, we're at the lunch with uh, George and the McKenzie group and then back at Poppy's. George is walking with the men to their table and he's trying so hard to not have his suit swoosh. Did you hear a rustling? <laughs> Maybe it's the leaves? At Poppy's, we see Jerry approach Audrey, who is working as the uh, hostess. She doesn't look very happy to see him. What are you doing here? Then he asks about the pie at Monk's. And she's like, you know what? I'm very busy. A man comes up and asks to see Poppy. And he's from the Board of Health. Jerry knows exactly. Oh, is this about the... <laughs> and he does a motion about washing hands. Poppy comes out and the man tells him to come with him. Audrey asks Jerry, what do they want with Poppy? Jerry tells her, well, Poppy is a little sloppy. Back at George's lunch with Mackenzie... They're all laughing at the table. I guess he's revealed why well, I thought maybe you wouldn't hire me because of my pants. And they're like, come on, that's ridiculous. Well, I heard the last guy got fired because his nose whistled. No, 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 Mackenzie says. He got fired because he wasn't a team player. Uh, here at Mackenzie, if you want to do your own thing, it's not the place for you. George says, well, not to worry. <laughs> for him, conformity is an obsession. A waiter comes by and drops off a complimentary chocolate cream pie and turns to George and says, the chef made it especially for you. Oh, George is kind of delighted, but then he turns and sees his fellow 40 short suit guy. He's the chef. So he knows something is very wrong with this pie. George shakes his head as the rest of the guys try to get him to share the pie. If you're one of us, you'll take a bite. Oh, George refuses. Back at Monk's, Jerry says, well, George, you didn't get the job. George says, no, but I'm the only one at the table who didn't get violently ill. Kramer is avoiding Olive because he lost his itch and he's been faking it for the last couple of days. All right, he's got to go over there. He's going to let her down easy. He goes over and stops her from trying to put her hand up his shirt to scratch. And he tells her, you know, there's someone else. Who is she? And he <laughs> sees the Elaine mannequin in Jerry's car, points at, <laughs> points at her and says, well, well her. 
Olive calls Kramer a liar. I've seen her in here before. She's not your girlfriend. And why is she in her underwear? Kramer's just like, oh, it's a style. Gets the keys from Jerry. And uh, yeah, we're going to go for a drive. She, she really loves that. So Kramer gets in the car and Olive is watching. And he pretends to, I guess, canoodle with the mannequin. And of course, he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. And the arm falls off. There's a tag to this episode as well back at Monk's. George asks about the riddle of the pie, but it's never going to be solved. Elaine enters, and of course, Olive gives her a weird look and says that a friend from Chicago who was shopping wrote her a letter and said that she saw a mannequin that looked exactly like her. She's like, what if there are more? Where are they coming from? And then we see a familiar face, Ricky, who met Elaine on the subway, getting complimented at his work. A lot of great feedback on his TR6 mannequin. TR6? I prefer to think of her as... Elaine. I love that callback. I think that's really clever of them to have (laughs) the designer of this mannequin. Who else but this creepy subway guy, Ricky, who became obsessed with Elaine after meeting her for just a few minutes. All right, I'm going to take a quick break and I will see you on the other side. The year is 1994. The world is reeling from the attack on Nancy Kerrigan's knee. Cleveland sets a record for the coldest day in history. And R. Kelly's bump and grind is taking over the airwaves. But something else is happening in a cramped mannequin factory in New York City. Something no one could have ever predicted. Ricky was a normal guy. Loved TV guides and riding the subway. He was also an accomplished mannequin designer who would never hurt a fly. That is, until one day, his most prized mannequin model was disrespected. Ricky, look! The TR6 was featured in the style section of the New York Times. They were doing a profile of that fancy store, Renitzi's. How many times do I have to tell you it's not TR6, it's Elaine? Let me see this. Hey, they can't pose Elaine like that. His precious Elaine bent over, half-naked and gagged. It was more than Ricky could take. And so Ricky set out to take revenge on Renitzi's. We just got a delivery in the back. It says TR6 upgraded model on the box. What should I do with it? I then know, unpack it, I suppose. Ugh. The head saleswoman, known for her brash attitude and intolerance for advertised sales, would have never guessed that her raunchy mannequin poses would be her downfall. Is... is the mannequin moving? Oh, oh my god! What is your pro... Oh, oh no! Get out! Get out! Get out! Ah! From the same folks who brought you Firestorm and Deathblow, comes the ultimate revenge story, TR6. That will teach you to pose my Elaine in such filthy ways. Who, who are you? I'm someone who respects mannequins. This Christmas, coming to a theater near you, TR6. She's no dummy. And we're back. So for the extras in this episode, the notes about nothing had a few things that I thought were interesting. The table read for this episode was done on JLD's birthday, January 13th, 1994. In deleted dialogue, the offending boyfriend who didn't offer Elaine any pie was named Arthur Fox. So it looked like there was a little bit more about this boyfriend, Arthur Fox, but unfortunately it got deleted out. In order to make sure that the mannequin really resembled JLD, they had to make a mold out of her face, which I've heard is a nightmarish process. I think I would I would freak out. I mean, it's a very claustrophobic thing from what I've heard described, like just having all that plaster on your face. No, no, thank you. There was some more deleted dialogue. And Elaine apparently had another suspect on her list as someone who could have made the mannequin, a dentist who took an impression of her teeth. And Jerry replies, Elaine, he's got the job as a dentist. I don't really see him moonlighting with mannequins. (laughs) It's kind of funny, but I'm glad that they didn't include that because that just makes Elaine sound kind of stupid. All right, moving on to Contributor Corner. Our trustee Greg sent in thoughts this week, and this is what Greg had to say. 
It just dawned on me that the actress who plays Audrey in this is the same actress who played the Nazi in the earlier limo episode. She rubs me wrong in both, not just because her characters aren't likable, but there's something about her crazy eyes. <laughs> she could be the sweetest woman in the world, but mm, I don't think so. Um, wow, I didn't really notice the crazy eyes. I just, I definitely noticed that she doesn't do much with this character, Audrey, at all. And it's it's just kind of, ugh, it falls so flat. Again, I liked her as the Nazi better. I think she was a lot more effective, <laughs> not likable necessarily, but a lot more effective as an actress. Next, Greg says, this episode isn't one of my favorites, really. Everyone's storyline is kind of weak, and they throw them all into one episode. I totally agree, Greg. I will get more into that in my final notes. Greg goes on to say, I love how Elaine gets into it with the store lady. She doesn't say anything particularly funny, but I like how once again she plays the customer who is taking her business elsewhere out of spite. <laughs> Did you notice the face she makes right before she leaves? She basically <laughs> hissed at Natasha. Oh, this is what I'm talking about. Five minutes, 21 seconds ish around there. It's, it's hard to know which like it's hard to know the timestamp when I'm watching it on Netflix. Sorry. But anyway, it's right around that time. Keep your eye on Elaine as she's walking away. Yeah, she she makes this. I think hissing is a good description of what kind of face she makes at Natasha. It's fantastic. I'm so glad you noticed that, Greg. Like I said, I've never seen that until this rewatch and watching it for the podcast. So, oh, so glad that you noticed that, too. And finally, Greg says, my favorite part of this episode is actually a George moment when he pretends to be the worker at the store and helps the same sized guy with the suit. The accent he uses cracks me up. George's small plot is actually my favorite of all of them. Completely agree. George gets the best plot of this episode. Me help you. <laughs> I think that's what you're talking about. And it's very funny. Thank you so much, Greg, for sending in thoughts this week. If you would like to contribute to Hot and Heavy, please email me at elainepodcast at gmail.com. All right, my favorite Elaine moments. Her interaction with the saleswoman is my absolute favorite. She does not get a ton of comedy in this episode, but she definitely gets fun moments for sure. And my final notes. This is a pretty average episode for me. I agree with with Greg. Every storyline is just meh. It's okay. I feel like we definitely could have shaved off some of the Jerry and Audrey stuff. I do like the whole plot of like refusing the pie, which apparently really did happen to Jerry. He was complaining about it to um, some of the writers. Just this woman he went on a date with. He couldn't he couldn't figure it out. Why would she refuse the pie? But I do think too much time is allotted to that storyline. With Elaine's plot. Um, I mean, it's silly. I don't dislike it, but I just wish she was maybe involved in another plot of the episode as well. And I think the episodes that do not have that dovetailing where all the storylines come together, I think they suffer for that. The best episodes are when they're all connected and they all have something to do with each other's plots. But that was definitely not the case in this episode. Everyone's plot was sort of in a silo, like just on their own. But um, yeah, I think that's that's also why I'm not a really big fan of this episode. Because not only that, it's just that each plot is mediocre at best. So yeah, with, with that being said, it's just too disjointed of an episode for me. A decent amount for JLD to do, but just not the best story and uh, not enough comedy for JLD. <laughs> my, my standard complaint. And I think that's all I can say about the pie. Thank you so much for listening. I am going to take a break for the holidays, but there are now 75 episodes for you guys to catch up on if you have missed any along the way. Thank you so much for listening and for all your support. Happy holidays, and I will see you next time.